Let's see you all. Yikes. You were great. You were great last night. You don't have anything to drink, so I'm going to steal. Here. I'm right. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats so our panel can begin. started okay welcome everyone um, and uh, good morning today is uh, it's a great day and I want to thank the chamber for putting this on every year we come and I think we all leave and uh, are truly amazed at what we learn um, hopefully uh, in this next panel we'll learn a little bit about the supply chain um, we are lucky to have two um, terrific leaders in the supply chain today. Uh, Tom Gentili, who runs uh, Spirit Aerosystems. That's not Spirit Airlines, so if you want a flight, he's not your man. And Paolo Dilsin. And Paolo is in charge of the global supply chain for Raytheon Technologies. So it's really what we have on one side with Tom is large, large aerostructures. You think about fuselages, you think about wings. Um, Tom is involved in that and all of the parts that go into that. Paolo, on the other hand, is very, very diversified. With Collins, you have electronics and all the parts that go into the specific um, individual applications. And then you go all the way up into uh, aircraft engines with Pratt & Whitney and then obviously with the pure Raytheon side of the business, missiles and other things. So I think um, today hopefully we'll learn a little bit about the supply chain and some of the issues we face today as an industry. And as an OEM, we, are, we clearly see the ramifications and, re and repercussions of the su supply chain and the disruptions. So um, when we look at the supply chain today, um, I guess the, the Churchill question would be, is this the, the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning in terms of the disruptions? Um, this has been painful for everyone, um, and, and outside our industry also. But where do you see us today in terms of the recovery and next steps for, for you and the industry? So Tom, if you could give us some insight. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Carol and the Chamber. I would say that uh, the recovery has started for the uh, supply chain, but we still have a long way to go. And interestingly enough, this year at Farnborough, usually suppliers get no attention, but we actually had requests for interviews from CNBC and Bloomberg because they said there's going to be very few orders, but the whole story is the supply chain. And so I think that's, that's very accurate, is right now it's not a demand issue. There's plenty of demand. It's about the supply chain's ability to produce. And I would say that the suppliers are stressed right now for a number of reasons. One is during the pandemic, a, a lot of us had to take on additional debt because we had to get liquidity. And so uh, also the interest rates are higher. So we're paying more in interest expense, which means less to invest in growth and productivity, number one. But at the same time, the demand has not recovered back to where it was in 2019. 
Uh, for example, in 2019, we produced 606 max units. Last year, we only produced 162. This year, we've, we've targeted 300. So we're only about halfway back to where we were in 2019. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing inflation uh, in all of our inputs, so labor, and material, utilities, logistics, and that's certainly a, a factor. And then there's shortages. Uh, there is shortages of labor. Uh, it's harder to hire people back right now. There are shortages in, in material. And I think all of this is contributing to a cash conversion cycle crunch, is the way I've described it. Because right now, as some of the production rates are going up, particularly on the narrow bodies, like the A320 and the Max, suppliers are having to go out, hire people, and buy raw material. But we're not going to get paid for that for some period of time, because that's just the way the cash cycle works. Sure. And so it's creating a squeeze on cash flow. And we've actually seen more bankruptcies in the last six months than we saw during the whole pandemic. So I would say we're on the road to recovery, but still stressed. Do you envision more bankruptcies as we go forward? And, and will that, those issues um, continue to create problems? And how do you think about managing that going forward? I think we're going to see more bankruptcies, yes. I, I think the issue is right now, in our industry, most of the contracts are long-term and they're fixed. Mm -hmm. So prices aren't going up, yet costs are going up. So the profit margins are getting squeezed, and I think that's going to continue. And that's happening on the defense side and on the commercial side. But what we're going to have to do is, is work with our suppliers. So we're doing things like, for example, uh, helping to buy raw materials. We're helping to level load, moving some work temporarily to other parts of the system that have capacity. Uh, we're uh, working with suppliers to convert their inventory to our inventory or purchasing ahead a little bit uh, or extending contracts. So all sorts of different things. Of course, we also will have to look at price uh, in, in some cases. But you know, that's something that's going to be uh, difficult discussions. But that's the cycle that we're in right now. I'd like to get Paula's view on that. But I'd also and then go back to how do we get capital back in to the supply chain? Because if we don't get capital in with the bankruptcies and the other issues you face, um, certainly in the short term, that we all face in the short term, are, it's going to be difficult to solve. So let's, let's, Paolo, I'd love to get your view on this. So, uh, you know, I agree with Tom in terms of where we are with the recovery and the addition of sort of capacity back into the supply chain uh, that feeds us. You know, I think hiring is coming along, but it's still a challenge. We lost a lot of skilled labor. And a lot of our manufacturing processes in our industries, specifically as you go through the supply chain, are very labor and skill dependent. So there is a bit of a lag in bringing new people into roles uh, and training them up and getting them skilled and then uh, making um, them proficient at their jobs so that we get the efficiency and delivery performance that we need out of the supply base. I think that process has started and it's progressing and it's gaining momentum. Um, and I think it's going to be another kind of tough 12 months as we work with suppliers and engage to support them. I think on the financial side of it, I agree there's definitely financial distress out there. I would say, however, that um, that's something that we've tried to stay very close to throughout the pandemic. You know, we work closely with, the, with our DOD customers to advance payments to suppliers throughout the pandemic on the defense side and on the commercial side we have actually uh, a pretty good program of monitoring supplier health and engaging with suppliers in various ways to help them uh, with their cash cycle. You know, we do a lot of purchase of receivables programs where suppliers can get paid uh, up front, you know, when they deliver, if they choose to. And we've been pretty active at supporting the supply base in that. But I agree, there is investments needed to start production back up, uh, at, or at least to increased rates and some suppliers are going to struggle with that and we're seeing it. Do we feel that we have more transparency into the system, especially into the lower tiers of the supply chain, which can be really, really problematic? It, it appeared to me before COVID, maybe, maybe the supply chain was a little bit lax in, 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 in trusting, let's put it that way, in terms of looking into the depth of the supply chain. Do we feel today that there's more transparency and a better understanding of the specific issues that individual suppliers have today? I, I would say certainly a lot more focus. Uh, we have been on site with a lot more of our suppliers. It, beforehand, we would do a lot of communication and interaction. Now it's really 
that plus being on site and in some cases providing resources directly to them to help them through their issues, both planning resources as well as operating resources. And so I would say there is a, a greater level of transparency, involvement, and I would say active involvement. I, I would say that, um, you know, we've always been driving towards gaining visibility as you go down through the supply chain. Um, I think what's different today uh, and what's changed over the last few years is that, you know, prior to the pandemic period, we were kind of in a steady period of growth, new products were being introduced. Our challenges were pretty similar from sort of years past. What we've seen coming through the pandemic is the shifting of supply channels, you know, the disruption of logistics channels, and that's been introducing a new set of risks and perturbation in the supply base that we've had to react to and address. And I think what that's caused is a much uh, deeper um, sense of urgency around going further down in the supply chain, doing much more advanced active risk assessment and risk mitigation. And, um, you know, we're seeing very uh, discreet products that you didn't even know went into your products that suddenly are unavailable, uh, impacting production. And all of a sudden, we're dealing with a supplier literally six tiers down to help them understand that the product they produce that they've got a problem with is actually impacting you know, us at Raytheon Technologies or our customers at Airbus or the DOD. And that's something that we just never had to do. So we've gotten better at doing it. And I think as we look forward, um, we're going to have to get very good at increasing and illuminating supply chain risk through various tiers much deeper than we have in the past. Yeah, and so, Jeff, oh, I please. wanted to just uh, follow on to that is we're also using digital tools now more with our suppliers, uh, both in terms of automating things like purchase orders and inventory management, min-max and things like that, but also to using software tools and digital tools to track material flows through the suppliers, all the way from raw material to work in process to finished goods. And, and these are some techniques, and I would say GE Aviation has really been at the mm -hmm. forefront of some of this. We're, we're following Your previous through, employer. My previous employer, <laughs> yes. And, uh, but we're, but we're, we're, we're learning from, from that and, and being able to now apply some of these digital tools, which creates a whole new level of transparency between suppliers and customers. Sure. I, I, the next question specific that, to that would be, as we look at this supply chain today, do you feel we'd be better off with more a larger supply chain, more diversified supply chain, or a more centralized supply chain that is more focused? Well, at the end of the day, it, it's suppliers that can deliver. And so whether it's, it's several or, or fewer, at the end of the day, that's what matters. Because in our, in our industry, as you all know, one part can disrupt a whole production system. And so if you have that shortage, you can't build the plane. And, and so we, 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 over the years, have been consolidating the number of suppliers, but that's not an objective in and of itself. What we're looking for is suppliers that can deliver and execute. So do you think about diversity of risk, diversifying risk, or do you think about, going back to our previous discussion, financial health? Now, there tends to be a correlation between size and financial capability. I, I look at it as level loading the system. So when we have a shortage in one place or some distress, we're able to move work around to places that have excess capacity and excess capability. So again, number of suppliers isn't an objective itself. It's about execution and the ability to deliver, not only in terms of the delivery, but also in terms of the quality, because quality has increased in terms of the level of expectation. Okay, uh, Paolo, Yeah, thoughts? look, I think that, honestly, you need both. Um, you know, if you have too diversified a supply base, it's very hard to manage, especially when you think of doing it through traditional means, you know, uh, purchase order placement, uh, you know, promise dating, emails, going back and forth, phone calls, checking on status, deploying of people to facilities to go check product out. It's just if you have too many suppliers, it gets too hard to do. Uh, so we definitely feel that consolidation of the supply base is an important part of uh, being successful because if we can consolidate into larger suppliers who, who can manage some of that risk and who have the systems that can connect to us and, and provide us the transparency and the visibility, managing the supply chain becomes much more doable. On the other hand, 45% of our supply base is small businesses. And that is important to us because it gives us specialization 
and we're a technology, we're in the technology business and we need that specialization to keep advancing our products. Um, and it also gives us flexibility and speed. So what we're focused on doing is, yes, consolidating, but also working on our digital infrastructure and our tool set that our supply chain folks have to enable management of suppliers in a much more efficient way. And we are going to need the supply base to invest in modernizing their tools as well and to be willing to be much more transparent in terms of status of production, bill of material content, so that we can monitor health of the supply chain and not in a punitive way, but rather in a way that allows us to plan better when we know disruptions will happen, we can plan better for them and be supportive. You know, there are many instances where we get involved months after the fact to help them expedite raw material or help them expedite specific components that we also buy a lot of and we have the leverage and the relationships to, to help them. We just don't know quickly enough. So I think if you have a lot of suppliers, you need a way to manage that mm -hmm. and see that visibility. But you know, we also need um, to consolidate down to suppliers that have the capability and can, and can support us. So when you look at the supply chain of a year or two ago, maybe even three, um, China had a major piece of that. Russia had a significant piece of that, certainly in terms of raw materials. Um, China, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, co current COVID status and, and, and potentially international relations, geopolitical issues, um, Russia, for obvious reasons, um, has changed that dynamic. What is your view of the current situation specific to, to those um, two countries, three countries actually, um, and how do you see it going forward? Right, well, I, I, let's start with Russia. Uh, the, the biggest issue with Russia was titanium. You know, a few years ago, half of the aerospace grade titanium came from Russia, specifically VSMPO. And starting with the Crimea situation back in 2014, the OEMs started to shift away, both Boeing and Airbus. But obviously with this current situation, Boeing completely stopped purchases from VSMPO. Airbus is still continuing. But everybody is looking at making sure they have stockpiles of titanium and also starting to certify and validate new sources. Mm -hmm. and, and this is going to be an ongoing challenge. I think the industry is probably okay for 24 to 36 months, but we need to start now to think about what happens beyond that. So, so that was the first issue with regard to, to Russia. With regard to China, China has, hasn't been a low-cost country for a long time. It's really about being there because there's, there's demand there, both from Airbus and Boeing on the commercial mm -hmm. side Absolutely. and from Comac on the, on the Chinese side. Although it's, it's getting harder with licensing going forward. And so I think that that part of the supply chain is changing. But I would say that while there is a focus on simplifying the supply chain and making sure it's closer, it's still staying global. It, it, this is a very global industry. And as we look at our supply chain, we still buy a, a fair amount from overseas suppliers because of cost and quality and, and their ability to be reliable. So I think it's going to stay global, uh, but I think you'll see less from China because it's no longer low cost and it's getting harder there. Uh, almost nothing from Russia because of the sanctions. And, and even a shift away from the titanium and the raw material that, was, that we did in the past with Russia. Paul? Well, I think, you know, I very much agree with Tom. I think the, uh, the situation with Russia has certainly caused not just our industry, but all, many industries, all industries, uh, to shift their metal procurement sure. to other sources, uh, other global sources. And so when you think about it, you lose a significant portion of the capacity of the world's uh, metal production and forming and forging uh, is now redistributed to the rest of the world and that's driving an investment cycle and you know we've got great support from our suppliers uh, in the space that are making those investments that are finding alternative uh, sources of raw material and and that's going to take a few months to get up and running you know 24 to 36 months uh, but I think that we'll see our way through that you know, will it be at the same price levels that we've been used to? Maybe not, but we'll have uh, that security supply. It'll come on board. I think when you look at the geopolitical situation, you know, and you consider China, um, you know, China, Russia make up a large percentage, the majority percentage of our raw material supply for most industries, not for aerospace. And what I worry about is as, dis you know, you have disruptions in China, 
does that, in other industries, let's say, start to move away from that? Does that put stress on the sources that we in aerospace and defense rely on? Um, you know, that they're going to have to make further investments to, to uh, accommodate that growth. So should that come to pass, I think it could be a and, challenge. And, and then that it runs uh, counter to the, uh, the discussion we had earlier, the point that was made earlier, relative to their capital availability. So right. we're, as an industry, in, in, in a growth mode. I think that's fair. Absolutely. Ourselves, Boeing. Um, we, we see the demand, the, the, the airlines on the commercial side um, want airplanes, without a doubt. Um, and they, if they want them sooner rather than later. Um, what gives you comfort that we will be able to not only, we as an industry, because we all have to work together, handle the, the current demand level, but also a ramping demand level from multiple manufacturers. What gives you that comfort? Well, for one thing, uh, the demand is, is certainly there. We, we see it on the Airbus side for the narrowbodies, for example. It, it never went below 40 aircraft per month. And Airbus has been fairly optimistic about 65 middle of next year, then 75 and 24. Now, maybe there's some shift out to the right a little bit on that, but very strong. And on the Boeing side, the MAX is now at 31 aircraft per month. It, it may stabilize there for a while, but there's certainly demand to go higher. So the demand is there, and the ability to then deliver it is what's key. And I would say, because there are shortages of material and supply chain challenges and labor challenges, part of the solution is going to be to think about advanced technology, advanced manufacturing. Some people call it Industry 4.0. But these tools are now getting mature, and we're implementing in our factories. So, Lean is always going to be important. Basic blocking and tackling, that's still important in, in, in driving s uh, significant results. But I would say digitization has taken on a new importance. Uh, being able to track workflows of, of material through the plants, through the suppliers. Being able to validate the, the uh, labor, and that they have the right certifications to check their quality, to make sure you're applying the right labor to the right task based on their, their levels of performance. Um, also, in terms of quality, we can now use things like uh, optical inspection, where we can take a picture of a golden image of how a part should look, and then compare it to each unit that comes through the production system and identify any defects before they get passed on to the customer. Uh, we're able to use digital tools to, for example, measure the height of a fastener, whether it's too high or too low, for digital skin quality. Uh, we're using a lot more automation in the factory now. And of course, it's robotics. But I would say it's smart robotics, and it's often hybrid. Mm -hmm. So we recently developed a new floor beam production line, and there are 11 different stations. At least four of them have manual input as well as full automation. And so we're, we're trying to take the best of both worlds to minimize capital outlays, but also get the better productivity. Um, and then we're using a lot of 3D printing, not necessarily for new parts, but for shop aids and tooling. And I think that's having a remarkable impact on the production system. Do you think there's the potential for certification um, on wing type of, or do you think? Well, for, for new parts, it's taking longer. I, I think we're going to get there in terms of 3D parts, but it's just taking longer. I think the immediate impact is really on shop aids and tooling. So for example, we can print a 3D uh, tool guide to help uh, drilling in, in a way on the, on the fuselage. I'm thinking of many different drill guides that we have been using that streamline the production system, improve quality, and, and also drive productivity. We're not there yet in terms of new parts, but on the shop aids and the tooling, we are. So in terms of this, digitiz let's call it a digitization journey, and it's a 10-step process to get to where you really want to be, and you have confidence in the program, what step are you in? Well, I'd say we're at six or seven. This has been a journey. We've been on it for five years. We've had a lot of help. I'll, I'll give a little plug to our partners at Deloitte. Uh, they started up a smart factory in Wichita where they bring customers to show how these new Industry 4.0 technologies work. But they've been working specifically with us at our plants uh, around the world. And we've made a lot of progress on digitization. We have a tool called FloorSight, which is the workflow tool, OptiCrew, which is the labor flow tool. and so. We've started the journey. We still have a long way to go, but I'd say we're at six or seven. Because I'm always concerned when I hear 24 to 36 months, as we talked about earlier, it seems like this industry is 24 to 36 months for my entire career from getting to the next step. 
So uh, it, it appears that, that we're on a path here that is sustainable and, and will work. I'd say the technology is maturing rapidly and we're deploying it in the plants and the factories at a much faster rate. Okay. Paolo, thoughts on, on that? Technology specifically? Well, you know, we certainly are putting a big push into industry 4.0 technologies in our facilities and the approach we've taken, I'd say we're probably about where, where uh, you know, where Spirit is. We, we, um, we've broken it down into like three sort of pragmatic uh, levels of activity. So the first is, you know, a big push on automation and the injection of smart tools into our facilities uh, so that we can um, improve quality, improve throughput, reduce rework, and, you know, rework usually consumes metal, and when you use a lot of metal, it, it makes a big difference. So we, we have a big push on that across all our facilities. In fact, our pipeline of automation projects alone is close to 500 uh, individual projects that we're working to deploy over the next few years. The second big area is getting our facilities um, to be able to actually handle a digital working environment, which means the deployment of industrial internet of things across our facilities. We have, you know, three years ago, we, were, we had it in like seven facilities. We're up to 86 out of our 180 OE manufacturing facilities already. And that capability allows us to pull data off those smart tools and off those automated processes and, and pull that up into a data layer that we can then use to feed the applications that tell us where WIP is, that tell us, you know, what the parameters of uh, certain parts running across certain machines are so that we can fine tune those processes and improve quality, which is all about improving throughput. And so um, those applications are being developed and being deployed across our facilities. And it really sets us up for a longer term push to be able to really become much more transparent transparent to our suppliers in terms of our production, our production status so that they can more effectively prioritize what they need to do to keep our lines rolling and also transparency to our customers. So this makes perfect sense to me relative to tier one. When I think about lower tiers mm -hmm. and digitization and investment, I wonder how that's going to work because without that, I don't see how you get the transparency, and I don't, I'm not sure how the system works without that. Maybe I'm missing this, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Well, in terms of the transparency, what we're going to do with our spies, they may not be able to make all the investments in digitization and automation, but the transparency is we're going to hook up to their ERP system, whether it's SAP or Oracle or some other. Uh, the, the tools exist now. It's almost like a middleware where you can go right to their ERP system to access their system so that we can watch the flow of goods through their, their processes. Again, all the way from raw material to work in process to finished goods. So that's, that's the technique that we are, are planning to use. But I would say for the lower tier suppliers, again, the basics still work. You know, basic focus on lean and Six Sigma to reduce waste, uh, minimize defects, uh, drive down cycle times, uh, improve flows, uh, reduce working capital. Uh, the, the basics in blocking and tackling still work, and that's, that's also going to be required. Paolo, thoughts? Well, I think my thoughts on it are, you know, we're going to need our supply base to make the same investments and journey with us, and I think the, the dynamics around labor availability today and raw material availability to some degree uh, are going to put, uh, I think, natural pressure in the system to, you know, drive that to happen. Having said that, I also think that it is an investment and we're going to have to, you know, go in steps. And we need to find ways, and we are working on some ways, that uh, make it easier. So even if you don't have the full suite of digital tools, you can still provide, in a relatively simple way, an, a manual input into where your status is and your WIP. We don't need to know every single point in the chain. We just need to know a few critical ones. And that will already help tremendously. And, you know, I always often use this analogy of um, Waze, you know, the navigation software. People in my team are literally tired of me talking about it, but <laughs> it's, to me, a fantastic tool when it came out, and it wasn't the GPS technology that tracks your phone and tells you where you are. It was how effective that 
software and that, that approach was at gaining community involvement. You know, I'm driving down the road and I see a car on the side of the road. It's one click of a button. I let somebody know. And, you know, I'm not asking for like a huge dissertation. It's very, very simple. And I think we've got to bring that into our manufacturing environments. You know, we need to make the interaction simple. And then you can take all of that information and then apply, you know, learning to it to understand if that's a risk or not. You know, until I started using Waze, I didn't realize there were that many cars stopped on the side of the road. It was like, <laughs> blows my mind. I can't go five miles without or were the police a or? warning. <laughs> right. So, more help. so but, but, you know, how do you get that level of community involvement? And, you know, suppliers letting us know, hey, by the way, my raw material supplier is like two weeks late. It's okay. We're not going to call and, you know, you know, it, it, you know, add like four meetings to their agenda for the next two weeks. But it's just input for us to know, hey, we're maybe starting to see some signs of issues that we might need to address. So uh, we only have a four minutes left. I, I think we, we have to have in this discussion a focus on labor. Um, we, we've talked about all the issues in terms of process and digitization and great things, but we need people. Um, and we need people as an industry because we're hiring, you're hiring, you're hiring. There are macro issues. How do you view your situation, the industry situation, and how do we make the industry attractive relative to other industries. And of course, there's the retention piece of, of the employees we have today. Any thoughts, and I, I'm sorry we only have a well, four minutes. <clears throat> I don't want Carol mad at us. Yeah. So obviously one thing with labor is, is wages, and we have to be competitive, and we have to keep up with the market, and the market has gone up. I, I will say in Wichita, between Spirit and Textron Aviation, the starting wages have continued to go up. And at one point, we said, well, we'll try a, a signing bonus. So we offered a $3,000 signing bonus to our hourly workers. They countered with a $4,000 signing bonus. <laughs> so we're in a bit of an arms race, but that's the market. So you gotta be competitive on wages. I think you also have to be competitive on benefits. And for example, we introduced a paternal leave, we extended our maternity leave, uh, full pay for, for longer, things like that. Uh, flexible work, we don't do remote work uh, at Spirit, because we're a manufacturing company, people need to be on site. But we started to introduce flexible work like the defense company uses, uh, the, the 980s or the 410s. And, and we find that's very popular. Because then when you're home, you don't have to work. Sure. You're doing whatever you want. Uh, we, another thing we've introduced is direct primary care in terms of health care. We have our own clinics in Tulsa and Wichita with dedicated doctors who only focus on spirit employees and their families. And we've seen some really positive benefits from that. So I think it's, it's wages, it's benefits, it's training. There's a whole host of things to try to improve the employee value proposition. Do you, do you differentiate between staff roles and uh, manufacturing roles and your thought in terms of hybrid and the like? Do you allow, the, specifically, do you allow hybrid working for your staff roles that are not on the factory floor? Uh, not hybrid right now, no. Okay. Uh, we have everybody in the office five days a week. But what we're moving to is more flexible schedules, the 980s and the 410s. Okay. The hourly workers, we need to be there. Uh, but we're looking for other ways to provide a, an improved value proposition for them. Okay. Paulo, thoughts? Well, I think my thoughts are, you know, if I focus on Raytheon Technologies, um, you know, our approach is really Number one, we're fortunate we're in a great industry with a great mission, you know, connecting the world and, and, and defending democracy. And I think that attracts a lot of people to our industry. Um, and, and that keeps people in the business, like it's kept me in the business for so many years. I think, you know, our work environments, we're very focused on providing, you know, making sure the work we provide our people is, are, is meaningful work. You know, making sure they're working in an inclusive environment and one that they can actually affect and change and, and you know, have influence into how they work on a day-to-day -day basis. If people are in that setting, they're gonna wanna stay. And so, you know, if we can attract them with our mission, we get them to stay through how we work together as a team within the company. And I think, you know, I feel good about where we are. And that includes flexible work arrangements. We have a large percentage of our population that aren't in the manufacturing facilities, are hybrid, 
uh, or remote workers, and that's a, a reality of how we're organized and will be organized going forward, and that's, we've had tremendous feedback from people around that. Uh, but we're only able to do it because we're also modernizing how we work. You know, we have modern collaboration tools. We're, we're changing the concept of work and what that means. And it's worked, we think, very well over the last few years for us. Now, we still need people in the office. We still need collaboration. Our people want that collaboration. And we're still, you know, our offices are filling up and we are uh, engaging face-to-face -face more and more. And we, I expect we will continue to do that. I think for our suppliers, you know, I, it's a little harder, I think, uh, especially our small businesses. And that's why I think, you know, there needs to be this modernization, modernization effort that also goes through those, those suppliers uh, to change the work environment so they too can attract uh, the talent uh, of the future into their companies. In the meantime, I think we're all doing what we can to Absolutely. hire. So. so we have uh, run out of time. I want to thank you both for what I thought was a very, very informative panel. So thank you, and uh, thank everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.